Can we do it? I think we can. And I would mention one other major development in the energy field that doesn't get very much attention, and that is the extraordinarily successful grassroots movement in this country, coordinated nationally by the Sierra Club, to ban new coal-fired power plants. As a result of that effort, we now have a de facto moratorium on building new coal plants. I, I doubt. I doubt we'll ever license another coal plant in this country. But beyond that, the campaign is now moving into phase two, which is to close existing coal plants. I was working on a list a few weeks ago. There are now at least 30, maybe more, coal plants in this country scheduled to close, either to convert to natural gas, to be replaced by wind farms, or uh, investments in efficiency. We've still got a ways to go because we've got some 600 coal plants altogether, but 30 is a good start. So we're beginning to move in the right direction, but we've got to move faster. Then the question is, can we do it? And I go back when I see how much we have to do and how little time in which to do it. I go back and reread the economic history of World War II, December 7th, 1941. The extraordinarily successful, in military terms, surprise attack by the Japanese on the U.S. Pacific Fleet, anchored at, part of which was at anchor in Pearl Harbor. January 6th, 1942, one month later, President Roosevelt laid out U.S. arms production goals. He said, we're going to produce 45,000 tanks, 60,000 planes, at least a few thousand ships. And, and people could not, we were still in a depression mode economy at the time, people could not realize, could not sort of grasp this. But what he and his colleagues realized was that at that time, the largest concentration, single concentration of industrial power in the world was in the U.S. automobile industry. Because even during the Depression, we've been making two or three million cars a year. So he said, uh, he called in the leaders of the automobile industry and said, because you guys represent such a large share of our industrial capacity, we're going to rely heavily on you to help us reach these goals. And they said, well, Mr. President, we're going to do everything we can, but it's going to be a stretch producing cars and all these arms, too. He said, you don't understand. We're going to ban the sale of cars in the United States. And that's exactly what happened. And we exceeded every one of those goals. I was on book tour in Seattle, Washington, where Boeing has most of its manufacturing facilities. And, you know, in the end, we produced 129,000 planes during World War II. And I was thinking, even today, the idea of producing 129,000 planes is challenging, to say the least. But we did it. We're now in a race between tipping points, between natural tipping points and political tipping points. Can we cut carbon emissions fast enough to save the Greenland ice sheet? Can we close coal-fired power plants fast enough to save at least the larger glaciers in the Himalayas and on the Tibetan Plateau? Can we arrest the deforestation of the Amazon before it reaches the point where the, the, the forest dries out to the point it becomes vulnerable to natural fire, and then it will not be savable? Scientists think we're getting very close to that point now. So this is, it's a race between tipping points, and time is everything. And one of our difficulties is that nature's the timekeeper because nature sets these thresholds. We don't know where they are. We don't know when the Greenland ice sheet melting becomes irreversible. The problem is we can't see the clock. We don't know how much time we have left. We talk about saving the planet. We've been talking about saving the planet is that, that's 22 minutes already, isn't it? Well, and I you said... Can, you can have all the time and not have the questions. I'll, I'll, you want to do it. I'm, I'm just about to wrap up. Um, and then we'll have time for a couple questions. Those of us working on environmental issues have been talking about the need to save the planet. 
about saving the planet for some time, but as I think about it, I think the planet's going to be around for a while. <laughs> the question is, can we save civilization? That's what's at stake now, and I don't think we've yet realized it, but we're seeing the stresses building, climate stresses, food stresses, energy stresses. Um, all the environmental trends I talked about before are putting more stresses, and the weaker governments are beginning to break down under these mounting stresses. That's the bottom line. And saving civilization is not a spectator sport. We all have a stake in the future. Most of us have children. Many of us have grandchildren. We all have a stake in the future, but we all have to get involved. Many of you are already involved, but if you're not, pick an issue that's important to you. Is it stabilizing world population? Work with some of the groups that are working on that. Is it closing coal-fired power plants? There's a campaign underway, and they could use your help to close existing plants. Or what about developing a world-class recycling program in your community? Save enormous amounts of energy. We forget how much energy we save by having a world, having good recycling plants. So my challenge to you is a very simple one. It is to get involved in these issues. This is not something that might happen at some distant point in the future. These are things already happening. We are now on a, a path that's headed toward economic decline and collapse. The question is, can we move off that path? Can we restructure the world energy economy quickly enough to stabilize climate, for example? These are our challenges, and that's why I'm so pleased to have a chance to talk with you tonight.